Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole White. I have a wonderful guest today. This is Sandra Duran Wilson, and we are going to talk about art and creativity. But before we get into it, let me turn it over to Sandra. Tell us a little bit about your background um, and what you do. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Nicole, for inviting me. And it's lovely to be here. I am kind of a, one of those unique people in that I believe you can do both analytic and art. I come from a family of both artist and scientist. So I grew up looking through the microscope in my dad's lab and drawing what I saw. You know, as a kid, I would like to do these little abstract cellular drawings. And my great aunt was a painter, an oil landscape painter, and she showed in galleries. And we would go around and do plein air painting. And that was starting at about six years old. So I was mixing up my own oil paints and, and working realistically with her. But I always loved the idea of science and the abstract. So as I got older, I began to look at different um, ideas. Time was something that has always intrigued me. And it's this illusion of time. It's like, is it really linear? And I mean, in, in our world that we live in, yes, we have, you do something and, and you get this effect. But in the imagination of an artist, you can just be wherever you wanna be at whatever time. And to me, that's the most liberating part about perception of how we are in the world. And I think that's been probably the greatest influence on me as an artist. Mm -hmm. So I do um, teach, I've been painting all of my life, but I went back to school when in my thirties and because I had finished, I, I didn't finish, I had dropped out and I had worked as a, a jeweler. And then I wanted to finish my science degree and my art degree. So I went back to UNM and studied fine art, but because I had been painting so long, I decided to focus on printmaking because it was something new I hadn't done. And it was perfect because it kind of incorporates the aspect of science into printmaking and with, um, Oh, I tried all different kinds. And so then I got also my degree in cognitive science. And so I was writing experiments and, and working with that. And, and then I kind of just moved into acrylic mixed media painting. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 something years. So mm -hmm. that's how I got here. And I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I've been here almost all of my life. I grew up on a border of Mexico and came here right after high school. So wonderful. And I'm I'm pretty sure that's one of your pieces behind you. Yes, it is. <laughs> and so you work on all scales and with all different kinds of medium. I do. When when I was in high school, uh, we actually painted a lot of large murals and um I remember painting, it was about a 12 foot tall day globe uh, imagery in this youth center. And, and then we painted the front of the building. So it was, it was fun, but I'd always painted rather large. And I remember there was an exhibition about probably 15, 16 years ago, and it was a miniature and it had to be eight by eight. And I sat with this little, canvas and I was like how do I do this how do I paint this small and once I did it I was hooked I love to paint small I mean I love to paint large also but I think you can learn just as much by painting a small piece as you can a large piece and sometimes even more because I find people have more freedom to want to try things on a small piece yeah um, Yes, I do paint all sizes. Wonderful, wonderful. And I know you and I do similar work in regards to how we work with folks and trying to help them draw out their creativity 
and nurture whatever creative spark that they have. And I believe now, especially now in these cra this crazy year, we're in 20, we're in December, 2020 as we're recording this mid December. Um, I know that the being home more has really just encouraged me to do more art, more art than I've ever had time to do. And so let's chat a bit about the importance of one's creativity um, outside of the box of it having to be, oh, I'm a mixed media artist, I'm a painter, I'm a drawer, I'm a musician, I'm a fashion designer. Um, because I know that creativity fills the soul mm -hmm. and that creatives often have sometimes a really great balance and outlook on life because they have that creative outlet, right? So I know you teach a bunch of courses. What are some of those key things that you like to help people with, with their creativity, especially if they feel stuck? Well, I think one of the, my, my last book, which was my sixth book, and it's called Awakening Your Creative Soul. And it really taps into that place within you that needs to create. Creating is like breathing. But so many times people have been pushed down or they've been told, oh, you, you know, they have a, a vision of what creativity is. And it's not just that. I mean, you can be creative in the kitchen, you can be creative in the boardroom, you can be creative in the hospital, in the lab. I mean, it takes creative thinking to really make the world work. And when you just kind of go along with, okay, follow A, B, C, D, you know, you, you're kind of limiting that. And so I had a, I do a weekly YouTube series called Mixed Media Soul Sparks. And I had somebody comment on one of the videos and she was saying that she had imposter syndrome, really bad. And that she just really loved watching the videos and finding, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, um, the freedom of just creating with what you have on hand and not having to follow certain rules. But the, but the imposter syndrome, it's, I, I see that a lot in people. And they think, well, I can't call myself an artist because I don't have my work in a gallery or I don't sell my art or what, I mean, there's a million and one excuses. But does that make you not creative? No, it doesn't make you not creative. And I, and I say to people that I've, I've coached a lot and, and it's like, okay, so here's your dream. You wanna get your work into a gallery. Well then just because you get the work into a gallery, that doesn't mean they're gonna sell anything, you know? And so what's your next goal? What's the next step? And there's always taking steps. So perhaps the first step to being creative is just to pick up your pencil or to pick up some paint and just do it. Mm -hmm. And I think people have that fear of trying to do something, fear of judgment. And the, the worst judges are ourselves, you know? So I have this great exercise I've done with students. And I used to use this when I worked in uh, counseling also. And I would say, okay, well, take a, take a pencil, you know, you're working on your table and just draw a circle and write mute in it. And this is your mute button. So when the critic comes out and starts to nah, 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 you just go over and hit that mute button. And I was teaching a workshop here in my studio and one of the women, I'm looking over at her and she's over there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, your critic must be quite active. And she goes, oh yeah, oh yeah. So she said it was the greatest thing though. She could just like mm -hmm. acknowledge it mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'm going to do this anyway. Uh -huh. And I think that's the main key is that, you know, anybody can be courageous if they're not afraid. But when you're afraid and you do it anyway, that's when you're really courageous. Yeah. Yeah. That's true in creativity. Absolutely. 
And I, I feel that, you know, there's so many artists online and, and it's so easy to feel like your work isn't good enough because, uh, you know, we just have this online world that is bombarding us with so many artists, but they all started somewhere. They all drew an awkward little stick figure or painted their first weird painting at some point. And I believe, you know, there's every variable, but I think that some children are nurtured into that art. And then I was talking about this with someone else the other day. Sometimes there's a teacher or a parent who just, they're, they're not right in their thinking where they'll put a child down and yeah. like, oh, yeah. you can't try. And it creates this limiting belief. So when people say to me, oh, I'm not creative. I can't draw a straight line. I, I'm not, an, I, I'm just not. I like to go in and go, well, where were you first told this? Because we're all born creative. I mean, a kid until they're broken, right? I mean, they will dance and sing and draw. And look, look how, look what I did. And then at some point, something happens and some people stop. Right. But some and, people and one of, keep going. One of, one of my studies in cognitive science was an analysis of creativity and you know, linking it with developmental studies like a Piaget of how children go through these steps. And there was, I can't remember the woman's name, off the top of my head now, but she had like a kindergarten, a preschool and in, in the Bay Area, going back from like the 70s up into maybe even the late 60s, up into the early 90s. And she had documented pictures of kids, what they draw and all children all over the world, they go through this same development. I mean, around two, there's the big headed people you know, they have all big heads and little bodies. And that is true across cultures, across the world. So art follows this pattern. And she saw that most kids would stop drawing at around the age of nine or 10. And this is when a you started to get analytical reasoning coming in and kids wanted to be able to paint something realistically. And if they couldn't, they became frustrated or if a teacher or someone else said, oh, well, that doesn't look like a truck or a tree or they stopped. Now, of course, there are the kids that have art wounds and I mean, or the adults that have art wounds. And, you know, these stories are just, and I've witnessed them firsthand when I've been working in museums with families and stuff. And it's just like, no, 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 you can't do that. But, um, but I think that's interesting to see that when it gets to that point of realism is when we see that break. Mm. And it takes time, it takes effort to be able to develop a skill. And I think that you know, sometimes we're more geared toward a particular skill than another. I mean, I know for me growing up, I played um, music, I played uh, musical instruments, and I play, I picked up guitar and started learning that. And I always wanted to be a rock and roll star, you know, and it's like, no matter how much I practice, and I, I just, it wasn't my, it just didn't flow for me. And whereas art was so easy, mm -hmm. and it was always easy, mm -hmm. that I thought, well, I kind of dismissed it a bit because yeah. it was easy. Yeah. And I was, well, I got to do something that's harder. <laughs> but finally, after, you know, after a certain point, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm not going to make it as a rock and roll star. So <laughs> I just pursued other forms of art. But you know what I mean? It's like sometimes some things are easier for some people. Yeah. So I think with creativity, to first acknowledge that we're all creative. And when I hear that, oh, I can't draw a straight line. I say, well, that's what a ruler is for. Exactly. You know, it's like <laughs> drawing. People think of artists as creating something, uh, 
realistic. You know, it's like we go to the museums, we see all these paintings and they think abstract art is just, oh, my two-year-old could do that. Well, you're right, your two-year-old could, but your 20-year-old couldn't <laughs> because it takes a lot of effort to be able to create abstractly when you get older. I mean, Picasso even said, it's like, you know, you learn how to paint when you're a child and it takes the rest of your life to relearn how to paint like that. Yeah. yeah. And realistically or abstractly, you're still working with the same rules of good composition and color, but you're also expressing an idea. Mm -hmm. And the abstract work is an idea. I mean, you can get the same thing with an idea through realistic work, just with your color, your composition, but our brains are hardwired to see a face and we're like, oh, okay, I know what that is, I can move on. Mm -hmm. So if it's abstract, you're like, well, I don't know what it is, where do I go? Mm -hmm. And as the creative person, you have to be able to direct them. Yeah. And I mean, even if you're a graphic designer, it's, it's like you have to use certain elements to, to keep the viewer engaged. Right, right. If you're the if you're the chef, you got to make the right ingredients, or the musician. You know, it's absolutely. It's all about breaking rules. Yeah, absolutely. And like when I teach watercolor or something like that, I'm like, I'm going to teach you some techniques, but then find your own find your own way. So, for instance, I know a lot of teachers will teach the way that they paint. Like if they're a realistic painter or a watercolor mm -hmm. painter. And when I talk, when I teach watercolor, it's more about let me show you what the medium can do in all these technique we ways, and then you can find what what you like, what you gravitate towards, and build on that. Meanwhile, these techniques yes. will show you how this medium works, and then have fun, explore, break the rules. Right? I mean, there, the there, this there is one point. Like if, if somebody is brand, brand new to especially mixed media. I mean, because I do the same thing, I teach techniques. But if, if somebody doesn't, they really don't know what their uh, mark making is, they, you know, they, they haven't even learned the lingo yet, then there needs to be a foundation built and some structure. And I learned this the hard way because like I said, I painted all my life. And so it's just, even if I'm pushing things and I'm exploring, I have a foundation that yeah. I'm standing on. Yeah. So several years back, I decided I had a project in mind and I wanted to do it in glass. And so I took some glass classes and I saw one, it was like print making with glass. I was like, oh, okay. So I signed up for the class at Bullseye and I was the only printmaker in there. The rest of the people were glass artists. So what I found, there was a series of three classes and I actually took them in the opposite way that I should have because the third class I took was the foundations. And so when I went into this first class, it was like, what are you talking about? You know, fritz, powders, this, slumps, temperatures. I didn't have a foundation and I felt so lost. And I mean, eventually I produced something, but it was a great lesson for me to realize that it's important to kind of have some foundation. So one of the classes I teach, is like finding your marks and it's mark making mm -hmm. and understanding how you actually move in your body. How do you move to make marks? Some people are much more fluid. Some people are more staccato. And so I have another class where I incorporate music and rhythms and mark making. Mm. And it's a way to connect your body to your, your mark making. It's yeah. like, I think the more senses that you can bring in to your creative process, it's just, it's just like with everything. The more you're engaged, you're in that flow. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So 
you know, I work with a lot of people. I do a variety of different things. I work with some people just kind of in a health holistic way, gut health, diabetes, things like that. And then uh, my love, my passion. I mean, and that's my passion too, but my my heart really sings when I could just express myself and, and be with others who are expressing themselves with art. And, uh, you know, I've run into so many people who uh, work their nine to five job. They've been, you know, there 10, 20, 30 years. They've got this creative spark and it's like a, a weekend, a once in a while thing. And what I usually share with people is find a way to engage with it every day for even just five minutes to where like, if, especially if you do it first thing in the morning, it's gonna set the tone of your day. You're gonna find you're more creative. How do you work with people who maybe come to you or your classes and they just feel like they're creatively stuck? You know, that mute button is awesome. Um, but, but, you know, what are some of the things that you share with people that really help open up and crack open that creativity without it having to be this final piece that you're gonna, sell right just to do art to be in the process well I, I i think journaling is really a great way to do it and it can be visual journaling it could be writing um, i'm a writer also and so for me one of my ways is to begin writing in the morning mm -hmm. and maybe it's just a you know a page or just some free writing i've always got documents open on my computer because I have blogs that I write. And so I've got an idea and this is just an example of how I work. I, it, everybody works differently, but I might start writing about something. And within a paragraph, it's like, well, these are actually three different blog posts. So I cut that one, it goes on to another page. I cut that one, it goes on to another page. So now from maybe 15 minutes of, just free flow writing, I've got three different ideas. So the same thing can be translated into a visual diary or journal. And I might, if you look at one of my, my sketchbooks, it's really not much sketching. It's, I sometimes have a lot of writing. I sometimes have ideas and it might be just a little thumbnail sketch of size or format that I wanna do. Maybe I cut some things out of magazines as far as colors or patterns. It's like, oh, I see that shape over there. And, and I call them kind of look books and idea books. And it's a great way to start. And then when I'm working on an exhibition that I need to create maybe, you know, 20 or 30 paintings for, I spend a couple of weeks just flipping through these books that I've done. And I'm like, okay, this idea fits in because my shows are all about ideas. My last one was, it was down at Pope Joy in Albuquerque. It was an exhibition called Other Spaces. And it had to do with science of other planetary spaces, but also concepts of space on our planet, how we regard space. So I flipped through my books. I found things, well, this kind of fits in or I like that and how can I work with that? So just creating these journals with ideas, with just quick drawings, with words, with emotions, with collage, it's gonna be an inspiration because you just, you kind of just get your glue stick, put it in there. Sometimes I'd even just use like scotch tape and put it in there, you know? Then you don't think about it, you don't look at it, you keep going, and then you come back to them, and you're like, hmm, you see, because when you're working intuitively, you're, you're creative, you're not going into the blocks, and so that's probably one of the best ways I have worked with people, is just, you know, go in and just make something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the sketchbooks. I mean, my sketchbooks are a place where I feel so much freedom. And, it, you know, I, I, I might be a weird thinker, but there's always a time where I'm like, gosh, if, if something happened and all I could do was pile my car up with what I was going to keep, right, it's going to be a flood or a fire, I would take my sketchbooks before I would take my finished paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Because... And 
I think it's because it's the process of creating, which is intrigues us most. When you're finished with it, it's like, okay, I figured it out. I'm done with it. But you want to have that ability to go, ooh, how do I do this? And that's where the sketchbooks are. Yeah. It's a good yeah. point. And, and for me, what I share with people is the sketchbook is really this free for all, right? And I'll do the same. Sometimes it's drawing, sometimes it's writing. Um, you know, it's usually with a pencil. Sometimes it'll be with a pen, but sometimes there's things that I can draw out, but it's like, oh, this needs a color, right? So then I write in the color with, with an arrow pointed. And I think if we engage with some kind of journal sketchbook where it's this place that we go to often, you know, people might think of it like a diary. It's, it's, it's where you express yourself. Um, I started doing this as a very young girl. I was in a household, I have a great relationship with my family now, but I was in a household where I just couldn't speak my mind. And so that for me is really where the art began, the writing and the drawing and the painting, because I could express myself in almost a cloaked way, right? I didn't have to write out exactly what I was thinking, um, but I, I could do it in such a way to where I was still able to express it, which for me, that's been my lifesaver, is this ability to have some place that's not judgmental, unless oh, I have to mute myself. I love that mute button. I'm going to make <laughs> one after we're off the yeah. making a mute button. We um, all have these extra, these extra remote controls. Just put a remote control. <laughs> Nice. Because you can always just turn down the volume too. Right. That right. That's true. That's true. I've made little things where it's like literally a knob with a volume, um, like as a book cover thing. And and yeah, oh, it's so great. <laughs> and and so I think like just some of the ideas that we're sharing right now is anything and everything goes and everything is energy and the more energy you put into it, it grows. So maybe talk about how you feel or encourage people in that way. Cause it's like anything, whatever you do every day, you get better and better or it becomes a habit or a ritual. So I've worked right. with people to where they're waiting for a time where they've got five hours or the whole day, right? So they won't do anything creative all week long and then wait for the weekend. But all they need is one little thing that comes up to where it's like, no, it doesn't work for today. So, you know, how do you encourage- I'm a list, I'm a list maker. And I grew up as a list maker and I still do this. And I will have a list of, these are the things I absolutely need to do. You know, like, okay, so I have an appointment with you to talk today. So that's on my calendar. I have something else I need to do today. And then I have the things that I want to do. And maybe I have three things I have to do and six things I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to intersperse those into my list. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you think about it, it's like, what do you have to do? Okay, so maybe you have to go to your job, you have to work, but do you have to come home and spend a half an hour scrolling through Facebook? Do you have to spend 20 minutes, you know, wasting time? You know, it's amazing where you can find time. Yeah. And so what I do is I put at the top of the list, here's an hour, here's a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And it's at the very top of my list of have to do. Mm -hmm. Today, I have to write for a half an hour. Mm -hmm. Today, in my coloring book, you know, today I, so every day it could be something different. Um, and it doesn't even have to be so focused. Perhaps you're going to go for a walk for half an hour. And in that walk, you're just going to be maybe listening to something inspirational or better yet, you're going to be just looking around you, being really present in the moment and observing, observing as much as you can, sensing the temperature, the smell, the weather, the feel of the ground under your feet, become really in that moment. And then when you get home, you write about it, you sketch about it, you take that 
and you do something with it. So that could be your half hour of creativity. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be something always the same. Otherwise, it might become more drudgery. You know, you got to get, here's one of my favorite things. And this is in, this is in my book and one of the chapters. And I make these inspiration cards and it's just easy to do. You know, you just take some pieces of paper and, you know, you can make them as fancy or as simple as you want. And they're going to have verbs, you know? And so when you pull a card, maybe you pull like walk, you know, so maybe you're walking, you're painting, and you pull these different cards, and you have to come up with different ways to act out that verb. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a way to break things up than what you think of every day. Now, I mean, I work every day in, in creating, but actually about half the time is the business side of art. The other half is actually making it. Sometimes it's more like 70% business, 30% making it. Yeah. So, I mean, I still make about, you know, 80 paintings a year or more. I mean, I'm working a lot, but it's not always just, oh, go into the studio and, you know, there's, there's the business of art. One of my students, um, she worked at University of Texas at Austin and she had always been creative. And I mean, even in her job as an academic, she um, managed a laboratory. And so when it came time for her to retire, she wanted to focus on making a living as an artist. And she came to one of my workshops in Austin and she got, and this is after about maybe three or four months of, after retirement. She goes, I have never worked so hard in my life. You know, she goes, I am always working because there's, when you're self-employed, you always have to be thinking or doing or working. But it was something that she always wanted to do. Yeah. And it brought her great joy. Yeah. But it's not, it, it's not easy. Right, right. So, so the main, the thing why do you want to create? Do you want to just create to have this access to it? That's wonderful. I think that's the most important reason to create. Mm-hmm. To make your living at it, it's it's hard work. It is. So first I say, tap into your creativity. How can it enhance your life? Mm-hmm. Because it will. And just bring you great joy. Right. So then you take it from there. Yeah. And And on that note, I mean, there's... I work with a lot of different entrepreneurs and it's really about creating that time for whatever your passion is. And it's very different working all the time. And I work all the time too, but it's very different working all the time when it's for you and it's for a goal rather than it's just time that you're putting in at a business that would replace you in a heartbeat if you couldn't show up anymore. So it's not this kind of hard work is not something to be like, oh no, then I don't want to be an artist. It's like, yes, because the passion for it will make the work, you know, it's like, oh, I have to do this marketing thing or this internet thing in order for this next step to happen. And then I know for me, once I do finally get time to just sit there and paint or draw or whatever, it's so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like the story of the stonemason. Have you heard this one? Of, you know, they're, there's, they're building a cathedral. Like I said, this is back in the Middle Ages. And this person walks up and the first uh, person, they say, well, what are you doing? And they look and say, can't you see what I'm doing? I'm hammering these rocks. You know, I'm chiseling this stuff. I'm, I'm laboring here. And they ask the next person and they answer, oh, this is my craft. I'm getting the angles of the stone just right. I'm polishing the stone so it's beautiful. And then the third person they ask, they're like, ah, oh, building this cathedral. It's a, you know, it's magnificent. It's, you know, so those are like the different levels of why you create and that place of creating this masterpiece that you're putting 
everything into it. You know, that's the place you're talking about of where we create from. And whether that is a half an hour a day, or if it's 60 hours a week, it's a place you can tap into that's going to renew you. Right. It's going to rejuvenate you. Right. And when you're just plugging, you know, punching the clock, that's draining. So find something that sparks you. Yeah. And it can be a side hustle. It doesn't have to be the way you make your living. Yeah. But you can all find a little bit of time to nurture that spark and help it grow into something bigger. Right. And so what do you share with people to inspire them? I mean, I like to share with people and I know it's hard depending on their family and relationship and, you know, if they're getting to bed on time, but I think starting the day with some kind of creativity, I don't know about you, but if I'm very creative at night, the first thing I want to do in the morning is go in there and be like, oh, look at what I did. Right. Look what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And that sparks the creativity for the day, even if I can't engage with it until later on that evening. Um, I know when a lot of people work and they're punching the clock, the nine to five, they come home and they're, I'm just too tired. And they're tired, but they can still sit there and scroll or watch movies or whatever. So how do you, how do you find that you help to inspire people to um, to take the time for themselves, even if they are tired. Well, I think everybody has different um, biorhythms of when they're feeling certain things. For me, it was like early in the morning, and I was never a morning person until about 20 years ago. I was always a night person. I mean, I was a bartender, so I'd get home three o'clock in the morning, you know, I was like, but um, when I discovered being a morning person when I went back to school and I could only do my uh, statistics or early in the morning and analysis. I worked with numbers. I could be up at like five, six in the morning and get all of this done. And by eight o'clock, I would look at that and go, how the heck did I do that? So parts of you are engaged at different times of day. And I think that's different for everyone. But I found I became much more productive when I became a morning person. And I, people look at what I do and they're like, oh, you must never sleep. And I said, no, I sleep eight hours a night and I get some of my best work done in my sleep. Mm. Because my creativity is primed. If I go to, to sleep at night and I'm thinking of something, you know, it's like, I love to figure out things. I'm a figure outer you know, the actual painting or making it, that's more the craft part. But my big picture is like the the stonemason who's building this cathedral. You know, I love to figure out the bigger process. So when I go to sleep at night and I've got some kind of a question, I ask myself, so what can I do? And most of the time I get my answer, usually early in the morning, right when I'm kind of half awake, half asleep. But for people that are more, you know, they've got to get up and go to get the kids out the door, you know, you're not going to have time to maybe get a lot done. So when you get home, you set aside that half hour to, you know, put your phone away. You can set the app to where you cannot access it. You know, you don't go in front of the computer and scroll through all your emails. This is your top priority on your list. And you go and I don't care if it's just uh, writing or drawing or whatever is going to give you that space. Even if you just go into the closet and sit and meditate for 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. you're creating, you're acknowledging that your creativity is important. And I think it's the idea that you have to plant this seed before you do anything. And planting the seed is, I think I just wrote a blog post about it called Planting the Seeds in the Winter. Because, you know, you're putting these seeds, I love poppy seeds, I take them and I throw them outside my studio in the snow. And they just, you don't have to plant them, you just throw them out into the snow. And as the snow melts in the spring, it gives the seeds some uh, moisture, they go into the ground, 
And when the earth warms up, they sprout. So it's, it's kind of like that. Creativity can be that simple. You just have to have faith in it. You have to throw the seeds out there. So when you come home every day, or if you have the time in the morning to begin, and maybe you can only start with 10 or 15 minutes, mm -hmm. but it's just like, it's like working out. The hardest thing is putting your shoes on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure you put your shoes on, you know, it's like, you know, once you get dressed to go for the walk or to work out, it's like, okay, well, I'm already ready to go. So I may as well go work out. Yeah. So have your tools available. If it's your journal or if it's your watercolors, I mean, watercolors are really easy because you can just work on a little tiny space. Yeah. You don't need a big studio like what I have. And you can just use a little uh, sketchbook and just have that right next to your bed or right where you put your purse down and just grab that first thing. Yeah. And make the habit of creating the time. Yeah. That's another thing that I share with people when I teach uh, any kind of art class or anything is have it out. You know, um, you know, if you have a cat, put a box over it. But I mean, have it out to where it sparks. It, it's almost like it's going to be this energetic conversation, right? If it's out. Oh, there, you. Right. Right. And we want that, you know, I'm very much, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. So I'm, I'm more about like bookshelves than cabinets, right? I want to see what it is. And so setting yourself up to make that creative time, leaving it out, having it set up, putting it on, you know, if you set alarms for different things, set an alarm for your creative time, put it on the calendar, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. On your list. <laughs> on the list. <laughs> so at what point did you transition into being a professional artist where you were actually making something from it? And how did that come about? Well, I, I actually started my first business when I was 15 years old. Okay. So I've always been an entrepreneur and I love business. I actually love to be self-employed. In fact, I've, I've always been pretty much self-employed. Um, so my first business came about because I wanted some, I don't know if it was a jacket or a purse or, you know, some trendy item that my parents were like, no, you can't have, we're not going to spend the money for that. So I was like, I'm fine. Well, I'm, I'll make it. So I figured out how to make it. And then my friends would see things and like, oh, I like that. And so I would make some more things. And then I started taking them to a shop and, and, um, and leaving them on consignment and they would start to sell my things. Mm -hmm. And later on, I was making pottery and then I went into stone cutting and jewelry. So I was bartending at night to make, well, I made money doing that, but I also worked for another jeweler and during the day. So I always had like two or three jobs and they were creative and you know even as a bartender you have to be creative one of my my favorite things is like i had a basket full of these little toys and so i'd put them out on the bar you know different people would be there and they'd like start playing with these toys and stuff and it was like great conversation starters and you know you'd have some architect over here playing with some musician over there and they're like playing with their with their toys and creating these scenes. And I mean, I, I was entertained by it, yeah. but um, you know, I think you can be creative in any job that you have. It's more the mindset mm -hmm. and you know, how you decorate yourself, how you decorate your cubicle. I mean, all of these things play into your creativity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've, I've, I know some people, they say they're not creative. And yet um, I knew this one woman where the brim of her hat matched her lipstick, which then matched her skirt and her shoes and her purse. And I was like, that's probably effortless for you now. She's like, it is. And for me, that would be like, oh gosh, match, you know, what? <laughs> I buy simple things. So I don't have to think about that. 
But we are, we all, I mean, like you said, cooking is creativity. Gardening is creativity. So it doesn't have to look like you're creating a, a painting or a piece of pottery or a sculpture. Like we can take this creativity into and parenting, you know, how you parent is creative. Yeah. I mean, teachers, you know, that teach grade school kids are so creative. I think the, the silver lining of this past year has been that people have discovered that, you know, the gardening or the cooking or baking bread or, or whatever it is, they're taking this time to do things. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we come out of this pandemic with ideas to carry us forward. I was just reading an article yesterday about even though small businesses are failing, even more are beginning. Oh, because okay. people are starting to say, well, you know, okay, well, I can work from home and that because I'm not commuting like in a big city, some people spend four or five hours or more a week. Some people spend four hours a day commuting that when you're not commuting, you suddenly find you have this time. time. Yeah. And, you know, people are even making balcony gardens or you know, learning how to cook with spices. So all of these things are creative. Yeah. And um, I, I, I see that as a silver lining of this past year. So if someone has created a body of work and they want to start getting into the business of selling it or getting into galleries or just their own website, what are, what are some things you, with all of your experience, you'd recommend for folks who who do want to start selling their work and maybe don't know where to begin? Well, be prepared. That's, that's the thing. And say yes. I've gotten into more things just because of those two reasons. I'll, I'll share a quick little story about, um, I have a gallery that represents me in Australia and I've been there twice for uh, solo exhibitions. And I got into the gallery I, I used to show outside at outdoor art festivals here in, in Santa Fe. And I was actually away at the time. I was teaching on the island of Corsica, but a woman came through and she was talking to another printmaker at the show. And so they kind of set up this exhibition. And originally the work was just gonna to go to Australia. Well, it turned out that one of the other printmakers, a very well-known printmaker, an older woman, they weren't sure if she was going to be able to participate. So my friend asked me if I would be interested. Before I knew anything, I said yes, you know, and that in turn turned into, they came over to collect the work. We were having dinner and I shared a story about how I tried to convince my parents to move to Australia when I was 10 years old. And they looked at each other and said, we need to get you to Australia. And so they took us over to Australia. And it's, but it's just something like that to, to say, yes, it's like, I don't need to know all the details. I just know I can do this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you say yes, and then you got to figure out how the hell am I going to do this? Right. But if I mean, you're you prepared, if you, them. yeah, 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 it's a motivation. To, yeah. But, you know, have, have a statement, have an understanding of what an artist statement is. You, you know, you don't actually have to have a website. I mean, I think websites still kind of the, the gold standard. I use a website that is a template based and I'm able to update it easily. And I think that's the biggest setback for people is they're like, oh, I'm not a tech person. I can't figure this out. Well, if you're an artist, you can figure it out. <laughs> it really is. I mean, the templates are easy, but photograph your work. You need to photograph your work. And, you know, the phones are great now. You don't need a whole heck of a lot of equipment, but know how to crop it. You don't want a lot of stuff in the background. So, you know, a basic thing, if you're going to present yourself as an artist, you need to have, um, even if you don't have a, a history of it, but say, you can say, okay, well, I've studied with this person. I've taken this class. I've 
uh, traveled, and this is part of my experience as an artist. And here are some photographs and you can put it on a, a business Facebook page. Personally, I don't like to have my information dependent on like Facebook or somebody. That's why I want my own independent blogs and videos. I mean, I have a YouTube channel, I have all of these things. But to get started, you can start simple. Even if you only have 12 paintings, photograph them well. You know, if you're, if you're wanting to sell, I was just consulting with someone and she's like, oh, well, I really need to sell my work and I don't know if the website is the best thing or an Etsy shop. And she's trying to do both. And I'm like, look, to get started, you really don't need to do both. If you feel more comfortable with an Etsy shop, get your Etsy shop up there. Personally, I don't, I have one, but I don't put anything on it. It's easier for me to update my website. So find out how you work, um, be prepared, and you've got to keep putting yourself out there. Right. Go to the local library. They're always doing art shows. I mean, yeah, right now everything's closed, but you're, you're going to spend the next, you know, six months getting ready. And then, you know, you do community. You start out in your community. And then you become the big fish in the little pond. And then you start expanding. And with the internet, you can be all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to say I'm appearing on refrigerators worldwide because I used to have postcards I'd mail out or people would come to the shows and they take my postcards and, you know, put them on their refrigerators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it's, it's daily steps. So it's just like in the steps to becoming creative. You have to train your mind and yeah, you're, there are going to be days. I mean, I have days when I'm like, oh, why the hell am I doing this? You know, nobody's paying attention or, you know, we all go through that. Even the most famous artists go through that or they have their big sale and then they go, oh, am I ever going to sell another painting? Mm -hmm. It's just part of being human. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're not the only one. It's like we're all in the same boat. Right. But just keep showing up for yourself. Yeah. Believe in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and there really is something for everyone. I, I mean, it's so interesting. I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it helps keep me motivated. Sometimes seeing some of the artwork that's out there that people are showing, like if you look at the real fine art and you're like, oh my gosh, they, you know, they paint photorealistic and I can never do that it can tear you down to where you won't even attempt to create what's inside of you. But I find it's helpful to look at all spectrums, uh, you know, abstract, uh, line art, all the different things that people put out there. Because for me, it helps me go, you know what? There really is something for everyone out there. My style isn't going to resonate with everyone, but I don't want everyone, right? I want the people who are interested in my stuff and you know, I, for one, I've, it's been decades, you, you know, that I've been an artist in some way, shape or form. And I've moved a few times and I've had to destroy stuff and give it away because I just didn't have enough room to move everything. And I've also moved through phases. But what mm -hmm. I realized I didn't do then, which I'm starting to do now, is to be consistent and to put it out there. Yeah. Because no one's going to find you inside your home. <laughs> no. I mean, but there, there are going to be people that want to create just for themselves. But if yeah. you had asked the question, if you want to do it as a business, I mean, there are a lot of uh, good online businesses. Actually, the website that I belong to, uh, the company, it's called uh, Fine Art Studio Online. And this past year, they put together an incredible free program on marketing yourself. And they've set up the template website to where it's easy to do. So I'll, I'll send you the link for that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you can start at different levels. So, you know, you can even have the beginning level is free. And then you get to the different levels. And I writing, connecting with your viewers is important. I send out a monthly 
newsletter, and I've been doing this for probably 15 years. And it's, um, you're going to find, and this is one of the things they teach in, in the, uh, the online courses, the free things, is that your collector base, no matter if it's 10 people or 10,000, it's going to be a handful of people that consistently buy your art. Mm. So you want to continue to reach out to them. You know, yeah, we think sometimes there's this big numbers mean a lot. Not really. Really develop the people who are going to collect your work. And in the beginning, those people are going to be your family and your friends. And I remember one of my first exhibitions, I still, you know, just probably second year in school and did a show at my house and my friends and and colleagues came over and I sold, you know, maybe 20 or 30 pieces. These were small works on paper. But out of those people that bought, you know, years and years ago, there's a handful of them that are still great collectors of mine. Nice. Hmm. Don't, great. don't dis disregard those people who start with you in the beginning because they want right. to grow with you. Right. And people are not buying your art because of what it looks like. They're buying your story. Mm. They're buying a piece of you. Mm -hmm. And that's why you really need to be prepared with who you are, what's your story, why do you create? Mm. Because that's uniquely you. Mm -hmm. You know, I have synesthesia, which is a crossing of the senses. So for me, music and math create colors like this piece back here was created to music so that's part of my unique story and everybody has a unique story of why they create or you know what type of work you know I I'm drawn to feminist work and other people might be drawn to more traditional work or historical work or so find what you like find your story Mm -hmm. And really uncover that because as you uncover your story, you're going to uncover why you create. Yeah. Yeah. And that's There's going to be your biggest gift going forward. For yeah. Collectors. Yeah. There's so many gems in that. And, and you really hit on something I, I personally hadn't thought before, which is somebody who buys one piece, you know, they're more likely to buy future pieces then um, it's, it's like cultivating the clients that you already have instead of, oh, thank you. All right, more, you know, let me get new people in the door, right? Because they're, they are, they're going to be the ones to support you and grow with you. you and grow with you. And, and people do when they set up their homes, they'll have a certain style often. And so, right. you know, if they move to a bigger home, it's like, oh, this piece was in this room. Now I need another piece for this room because I've got right. a home or something like that. I've, I've done a lot of commissions based on that. Okay. Maybe I've met them or maybe they got a piece at a gallery or perhaps they met me in person at an outdoor show and they then move or, you know, life changes and, and they want to commission another piece. Mm. So that's another way to, to grow with it. Yeah. One of the things I get asked a lot by people, especially when they're starting out, because they might be working in so many different styles. So someone, you know, they might have a watercolor floral and then an oil landscape, and then they're experimenting with collage. And then they're, you know, and it, I think it's great to do all of that. But when you start to set up a website, it's, it's better to focus on uh, maybe two different styles. You don't want to get too many different things out there because it starts to confuse people. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to maybe put a couple of styles on Etsy and a couple of styles on your, on your Facebook business page and a couple of styles on your website. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say you can't do that, but find a niche where each may work. Great. So talk a little more in depth about that um, because, you know, and I've heard, I know these concepts from, from a lot of the different marketing and things that I've been in. 
And so how would you approach? Uh, so for instance, you know, like I'm doing a meditation series and then I have an angel series and then I've got a Raven series and some of them are similar styles, but some of them are different styles. So what would, you know, what would be, you know, a good recommendation? Like if somebody does have, say they have photography and pottery and their line work and their paintings, would you say to them, just hold back, pick just a couple and put up on a website or have different sources for the different? I would say have different sources. Like I said, maybe put your pottery on Etsy and put, put your paintings on a, on a website. Mm -hmm. And your photography can go on Fine Art America where people can buy the prints. Mm -hmm. So because each, each different site is going to draw different people. It's just like when I used to do the outdoor shows and I'm setting up my 10 foot by 10 foot booth. If there were like so many different things in there, people are like, well, who's that artist or who's that artist? And what happens is they think, well, if you're just kind of doing all these different things, is there one thing that you're really good at? What's your favorite, you know? So you need to be able to direct people. And if you have the different sites, like say um, Facebook, website, Etsy shop, Fine Art America, then you're gonna be able to direct like the people to, to get that. Right, right now, I mean, this has been on my, to-do list for a while and I haven't actually gotten to do it, but it's to get some prints up on Fine Art America because not everybody can afford hundreds of dollars for a piece. So if I can get a print up there that, you know, they might be able to get a big piece for a few hundred dollars rather than thousands. And so it just opens up another place for people to start to collect. And one of my favorite collectors was a 10 year old girl. She came in with her parents and she'd been saving her um, babysitting money. And they were at the outdoor art show and she was going around and looking in all the booths. And I, have, I had prints there that I had printed myself that I would sell and they were like $50, I think. And so she spent a lot of time looking through them and I was, talking with her and talking with the parents and she went and looked at all the other booths and she came back and she decided she wanted this particular piece and you know I I know that she'll be an art collector and I mean maybe not my work but you know she had that passion mm -hmm. so if you can start with a $50 item who knows, someday somebody might have 500 or 5,000. So it's good to have different price points, mm -hmm. but I think trying to do photography, you know, um, sculpt, you know, uh, clay and so many different mediums, it's just a little too confusing for the viewer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there's different venues. I mean, it's not to say you can't have them, just have different placement. Right, that's a great- And even like said, so if you're, if you're series, like your Raven series or your meditation series, if they're all like works on paper kind of thing, mm -hmm. you can have that on a website and just say Raven, you know, and just name the different series. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do my website by sizes. I have small works, midsize, large works, works on paper, commissions, so, and sculptures. Right, right, right. And it seems like you have kind of through the years, you'll find a process that you really love and be with that for a while. And then do you find that it evolves? Like, you know, you've mentioned a lot of the different modalities that you've you've been in throughout the years, you know, glass and, and all these different things. Do you kind of stick with one for a while and then have it? Well, I mean, you know, the, the glass was, a. Uh, there might be a lot of things that I study, but there may be, they're kind of growing toward a vision I have. Um, two dimension, I, I wanted to be a sculptor and do large outdoor sculptures because the whole time I was doing my jewelry, I envisioned them as like little miniature sculptures. But when I was finishing my fine art degree and I wanted to do graduate work at the same university, they wouldn't let me. Mm. And because they said, oh, well, you need to study with some different people. And I said, well, I haven't taken any sculpture 
So for me to get my MFA in sculpture would be a completely different set of um, professors, but they wouldn't let me. So then a friend of mine who was a professor, he goes, you don't need an MFA unless you plan on teaching in university. He goes, just go do what you wanna do. And he said, this is what you would learn to do in an MFA program. And so I went out within six months of graduating and I did all of those things that he suggested, you know, producing my own show, learning how to do the video, learning how to do the photography, all of these things. So my greatest education came after university. Mm -hmm. But as I continued to learn other things, they just would go to developing my visual because what I figured out was sculptures harder to sell. And at that time, I needed to make a living to pay my bills. So I said, I'm, I'm going to go with what I can sell. And two-dimensional art was selling more consistently at that time. Mm -hmm. And the other things I do, whether it's writing or, or video or different things like that, they're maybe they're just for me, you know, maybe they're not out there, but, but I think everything contributes to how we create yeah. in the end. Yeah. Whether it's something that gets put out there. Right now, I'm kind of in this mindset to where, do I really need to make more stuff? Mm. You know, and it, it's like, I have so many paintings and I've taught so many people how to paint. It's like, what's my next reinvention? Because I reinvent myself every decade. And so I'm in the reinvention process and I've got a new project that's in formulation and I'm working on some residencies and some grants to make, um, it has to do with uh, sounds of trees and nature mm -hmm. and getting translated into mark making but not so much for a product to sell, but more as a process. Yeah. So that's my reinvention. Wonderful. Um, I, I'm gonna be mind, oh, we, we've gone a little bit over. Do you have time for one more question? Okay, one more. Um, what, what does the teaching do for you? Um, and what, what, what brought that in? Hmm. Teach, you know, I love, teaching other people to see that aha moment. And I was teaching in, I was teaching meditation, I was teaching uh, site specific art installation as I was working as a mental health counselor at a residential treatment facility. We had art therapists that would work with individuals. But what I was doing was bringing uh, spirituality and art together in a way that was intuitive. And whether it was with drumming exercises or building a, a labyrinth, we did all of these things. And just knowing what a difference it made for people. Um, when, I, when I left there, I just wanted to continue that process of sharing with people and then I started writing books about techniques and that in turn led to more teaching. And so now I'm doing the online teaching and it's just, I just love it when I get these messages from people that are like, oh my gosh, you said this and it made such a difference. It's like, I never know what I'm gonna be babbling about that's gonna make a difference for somebody, but I just kind of put it out there and whatever somebody needs to hear, they kind of grab it. And um, that's, that's why I teach. I mean, it's, it fulfills a part of me that it's a connecting uh, spiritual level that I get as much from it as, as I give. Absolutely. Same thing when people come back and they're like, oh, I'm painting every day. I'm like, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I quit my job and I'm, you know, I'm in this gallery now and I, I do, I get that. One of my students, I love this story. She came with, um, she wasn't even a student at that time. I didn't know her. She came with a, a friend and the friend was my student and they bought some work from me. They were visiting Santa Fe. And then she, she went home and she decided to come to a class with her friend, the next Santa Fe's workshop I had. And she came and, and she just loved creating. And 
she told me later, she goes, in her family, it was her sister who was always the creative one. It seems like there can only be one in a family, right? But, <laughs> but um, so she had just retired from her corporate job. And so she started taking more classes. Well, within a year, I mean, this woman had done this incredible body of work. And now she has a book with her imagery and her spiritual quotes. And it's just, it's wonderful. Mm. So something like that is just like, wow, you know, you just need to plant a seed and yeah. watch it grow. It is. It's so satisfying. I taught a, a write your own book class. I've also written a book and it was so satisfying to see what people came up with. And one of them uh, created a deck of cards and then a book afterwards. And I kind of forget because I know this person. And then she's like, you inspired me to do it. And it's like, oh, wow. You know, I did something good. All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And she's, and she's just bet, and it's just like helped her flourish. So it is, it's, um, I think these days, especially, I mean, it's always been this way, but now, especially this, we need more connection and really to lift one another up. It's not about competition. There's plenty of space in the world for everyone to have their voice and their creativity. And that's what I, I'm wanting with this uh, video, YouTube podcast thing that I'm creating is to bring other people on. We can come together and bring these inspirational ideas. So Sandra, thank you so much for your time today. I so appreciate you. Tell people how to get a hold of you. I'll also post it in the links below. Okay. Uh, SandraDuranWilson.com is my fine art website and AwakeningYourCreativeSoul.com is the site where all of my online classes and books and everything else uh, blogs and uh, awakening community, everything is there. And then I'll send you the links for Facebook and Instagram and all those other social you media. Too. Okay, places. great. Yeah, those will all be posted below. Uh, thank you everyone for watching or listening to this. And I hope that it sparked some creativity in you and make time for you make time for you and your creativity. It makes such a difference in your life. And when it, when you make a difference in your life, you can then make a difference in other people's lives. And we do, we have to fill our vessel as well. Um, you know, if you're a giver or a mom or whatever, and just giving, giving, giving to your business, to your work, you have to refill that vessel. So I hope this conversation sparked some creative ideas within you and write them down, start the process. You can always start today. All, All right. right. Well, thanks, thanks Nicole, for I, having me. Absolute okay. pleasure. Blessings. All right. Okay. Thank you.